when you are in those remote locations, very high risk, you hear the explosions around you. You, you don't do that if it's not necessary, if it's not critical, if it's not purposeful. And I think when we, the people who have remained in these areas, when we meet with them and they see the support, that's when you feel that it is worth it. From the United Nations, I'm Melissa Fleming, and my guest this week is Carolina Lindholm Billing, the representative of the UN Refugee Agency in Ukraine. Carolina, I just a, a question because I understand you were assigned to Ukraine before the war started. Yeah, yes, I I didn't apply for this. <laughs> You didn't. I mean, it must have been quite shocking for you and having to adjust your mandate and your role, and I assume to very much expand. I know that you've been traveling and responding to needs all over the country. And what is the like the worst hit areas that you have seen? Well, I do indeed travel a lot, and this is very, very important for me to see myself firsthand what, you know, the impact on, on, on ordinary people, their lives, their homes, their futures, their plans, their livelihoods are. Among the most difficult have been um, in Kherson region, for example. I mean, I was um, uh, in Early July, I was both in, again, for the second time in Kherson city, but also in um, uh, Khromada, in a, in a location called Bilozerka, which is not only very, very close to the front line, but it was also flooded when the Kakovka Dam was destroyed. And in the villages there, the water rose to over three and a half meters high. And there it was terrible because I met, you know, some of the people who had not only lived with shelling, with hostilities, with attacks for more than a year, but then on top of that, their homes had been completely flooded. You know, one of the people I, I met was uh, uh, Sasha, a man who was, his house had completely collapsed from the weight of the water when his his home and the and the neighborhood was flooded and now he was standing there with the help of volunteers some being neighbors a few people who had actually traveled from western ukraine to bilozerka to help people like sasha just start the recovery from from the impact and they were now working on just clearing sweeping you know the ground and he said I'm now, I have to build a new house before the winter. You said that there had been shelling for over a year. These are people who decided to stay. They're at the front lines. And then this horrific flood. When you arrived at the scene, I mean, what, what did the scene look like? The water had now receded, but you could really tell that, you know, it, it had been flooded. So, for example, I also visited several homes where, you know, it, these are houses built on, on clay ground where, you know, the, the, the floor, the walls were all kind of destroyed because they had been underwater or, or immersed in water for, for weeks while the water was receding. The smell was still there from the sewage. And the, like this Sasha who was clearing, it was a, you know, it was just a flat, uh, ground on which his house had stayed. He, he explained he had lived there since uh, 1992. He had built the house himself. There was nothing left of the house except the rubble on the side. And then you had several houses along the same street that both had signs of, of shelling and, and, and shrapnel on the walls and, and, and destroyed windows, but also this yeah, how, how when water, you know, just immerses your house and the walls, how, um, yeah, it looks 
like mold and and you know it, yeah it 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 looked horrible so many people millions of people have fled and made that decision to leave their homes but you had you you went to this place where despite the shelling despite the flooding despite this horrific condition of their homes or complete destruction they're staying why 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 is that what did they tell you about why this we see a lot that people people they leave as a last resort if you can stay you choose to stay i i hear so many people saying that and see it as well even those who flee within the country because it becomes unbearable to stay in their homes because of the the danger to to their lives and to their homes more often try to then flee within the country but remain close to their homes yes yeah, some go to the far west of the of, of ukraine places like lviv mukachevo and uh, chernitsy but many choose to stay close to their homes and it's because your home is is your home and it's not only your house that you have built maybe yourself or you have um bought with money you have saved and earned and you made it into your own safe home but it's also your land and your roots your community and that living in displacement somewhere where you have to start new is is very very difficult emotionally economically and it's also the the unknown so people if they can many stay where 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 they have their homes and we also see that this return to your home as soon as it's felt to be safe to do so i mean you mentioned these volunteers the i i've read about them the volunteers from ukraine who go where houses have been destroyed and help to rebuild them tell me about them they they are incredible and this you know when when the full scale invasion started it was really volunteers that came out ordinary people neighbors um i remember in the west of ukraine in lviv where i stayed for a few weeks before returning to kiev professors from a university who were cooking meals for idps internally displaced people who had fled and were now sleeping on mattresses on the floor in a dormitory and they were cooking meals there in the in the canteen for everyone who came you know on evacuation trains from the east with just the clothes on their bodies this has continued to be something that that has um, kind of signified that the ukraine response that volunteers from all areas of the society have helped people who have been directly impacted by the war and yeah cooking meals giving clothing giving money um opening their homes there is also a program called prehestok where um ukrainian families are hosting internally displaced people in their own homes so it seems like everybody is doing something is contributing some way yeah it's truly a whole of society response and support when disaster strikes you you try to get to those front lines and to do what you can to help could you just describe you know what kind of help can you and organizations provide and speci- also UNHCR so in this the priority first priority for the humanitarian response it's to assist people living in these frontline communities in the east and south of the country that are feeling um the hostilities and the and the and the shelling every day so what we provide is for example emergency shelter material so that people whose homes have been um damaged windows broken a hole in the roof a hole in the wall can quickly cover these up to prevent you know rain wind from coming into their home and also destroying their people's belongings there we also provide uh non-food items 
Um, many of the people have had, you know, all their, their, their mattresses, their blankets, their beds, their kitchens destroyed. So it's these basic items that people need now because they, um, yeah, they, they, it's, it's been destroyed or IDPs that have fled without anything but the, but the clothes they are wearing who need these basic items. Cash assistance is another because when you have um, lost your, 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 your job, you've had to flee and you need money to pay for hygiene items, medicines, pay rent, this cash assistance is a contribution to help you pay for those basic needs. We work with many partners in this response and the UN agencies, but also the volunteer organizations, the NGOs, they provide different types of support. So um, UNICEF provides uh, bottled water, for example, to people who were affected by the Kakovka dam destruction, um, WFP food support, and so on. So it's that emergency humanitarian aid to people on the front lines. But what is also very important for UNHCR as a protection agency is, um, for example, legal aid to help people recover lost documents because many people lost their ID documents or they haven't been able to register birth of their children or even deaths of their loved ones to get death certification. So one of our programs is to provide free legal aid so people can restore their basic documents in order to then identify themselves when they seek help with the social services or the administrative services. This is key for their own protection. And so many people who have now had their homes destroyed or damaged who need property documents in order to apply for compensation and assistance to repair those damages. Uh, that's um, a huge request for free legal aid to help get your documents because in Ukraine, many people don't have this because of the way properties have been inherited. And then we provide that aid so you can then apply for the compensation and get the assistance you need to repair your home. I, I haven't kept track of the, the huge number who fled across borders um, and your colleagues in the neighboring countries are, are there assisting them. But you mentioned that many of them have decided to come back and you're there on the other end trying to help them navigate and, and get their properties back. and. What are they telling you about why they chose to come back when the war is still raging and parts of Ukraine that they're returning to are still highly dangerous? Missing home. I think that's one of the key reasons why people want to come back despite the continuation of the war and continued threat to their life and well-being is because they have missed home and they want to come home and they miss their families, they miss their communities and that outweighs the risks that living in a country at war still presents to them. And for example, one of the programs that we are delivering as UNHCR is, uh, it's a pilot with a Ukrainian private company that produces prefabricated houses. The company is called Q Home. And these are 25 square meter houses that are made by Ukrainian workers, Ukrainian material here in, in Kiev. And it's delivered to the land of people whose houses have been completely destroyed. We've just done hundreds of these so far. And what the people, I visited several of them, these families who have received it, and they say the possibility to come back and live on your own soil, your own ground, your own land, next to your own garden where you have your flowers and you're planting your vegetables, you know, they say this is so important for our recovery and our kind of hope for the future. 
even if next to this prefabricated home is you know, the rubble sometimes still, what remains of their completely destroyed house, they say that it's still, it's better to be on your own land than to live maybe in a collective center as a displaced person or in a rented apartment in a city far away. So that feeling of, yeah, being, being, being home, in your physical home, in your emotional home, in your roots um, is yeah it, it, it's it's I think also what makes people still remain in frontline areas even though they are at risk of, of, of losing their their lives every single day yeah. and maybe those very homes being destroyed again I see you when you were describing being able to deliver this kind of material. I saw you smiling because generally in these big emergencies with so many people in need, what UNHCR can provide, as you mentioned, were these kind of plastic sheets to cover windows and temporary fixes. But this seems this seems more permanent. I mean, how did you feel when you were able to deliver a more permanent feeling home for people to rebuild? It then it feels like that it's a more meaningful, you know, con contribution. That it it's it's something that um, contributes to starting that process of recovery. Because what I've seen so clearly during these last six hundred plus days of, of of the war in Ukraine is how quickly people want to recover. You know, in Ukraine, you have the war is ongoing and every single day there are people being killed and injured and maimed and homes destroyed and schools destroyed or damaged. Plus, you have all those millions of people internally displaced who are feeling every day the kind of prolonged impact of not being able to live in their own house and go to their old job and the kids being in their old school but having to live somewhere else and pay the rent and find a job and get to know a new community but then next to side by side with all of this you have this incredible determination to quickly recover like i i came back to kiev on the 13th of april 2022 from six weeks or so in Lviv and you know the city was almost deserted when I came back it was really eerie and very few people there but just within a few days a week two weeks three weeks started to see how people were coming back to Kiev to their homes and finding I mean the the huge um, how how sad it was to see find their homes destroyed or damaged windows broken things turned upside down in you know in in their homes in their living rooms in their bedrooms and kitchens but almost immediately taking up a kind of broom and sweeping away the glass from the floor covering the windows with this wooden um, plywood that you cover cover the windows and clearing kind of clearing the rubble from what could be saved and rescued and immediately starting that process of recovery. So I, I and, and it, this I see every single day in Ukraine. So when we can be a little enabler of that recovery, I think that feels meaningful because the people I, I meet here they are so incredibly strong and brave and determined. And I have such respect and admiration for them. And they don't need us to assist them. I think what they need is some enabling support to recover those documents that were 
you know, burned in the fire when their house was attacked or, or, or destroyed when it was, the house was flooded because of the Kakovka Dam destruction, or they need that enabling support to repair those windows and that roof so they can move back into their own home. Um, that's what I think we are, we are here for, you know, enabling that recovery and people's ability to regain that protection and dignity and ability to get back and live their life on their, on their own again, like they used to do before this horrible war. I mean, I'm wondering, I mean, you have worked in many crisis hit areas around the world throughout your career. What is it about Ukraine that has particularly shocked you? To really see firsthand the very raw and fresh scars and destructions, you know, physical, mental, environmental caused by a war and how horrific war is and how it destroys the lives and the, and the security and the futures and dreams of just ordinary people who were living their lives in peace with no need for humanitarian assistance before the war. And now they are all of a sudden in need and, and vulnerable. And also that my colleagues, I mean, the majority of my colleagues are Ukrainians. They are also very much directly affected and, and victims of this invasion and war. And I have colleagues who have been displaced two times or three times. Colleagues who fled from Donetsk or Lugansk in 2014 to, for example, Mariupol, and now had to flee again. Many, many of my colleagues are displaced themselves or they have family members abroad. Some haven't seen you know, their wives and their children for, for a year or even more. Because their family members are refugees and they stayed behind. Yes, yes. To work. I mean, you and your colleagues from the other agencies um, travel very often to the front lines and try to help people. You mentioned that's the primary focus of your work. How dangerous is it for you? We go to these very high risk areas with our, which are within just a kilometer or a few kilometers from the front line. And when we are there, often we, we, we hear, we see, uh, yeah, the, sh the shelling and the attacks. So there is, there is a risk. Of course, we mitigate it by um, having, we, when we go so close, then we, we go in armored vehicles. But of course, we are there to deliver assistance. And as a protection agency, we also are there to try and speak with people who will still remain there and or who are there from the local authorities. So there is, there is that risk, and, and there have been humanitarian um, workers who have been killed or injured during the past year and a half plus. And this is always the biggest or one of the biggest challenges in humanitarian work, that where the security situation is the worst, that's where the needs are the greatest. And our assistance is most needed. So to find this balance where you are relevant for those people who are living in the greatest need, in the greatest security risk, without putting yourself, your staff, your colleagues at an what we call unacceptable risk, it's one of the most difficult decisions I feel I, I, I take in my work. Do you ever get frightened? Yes, I do. 
when 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 you are in those remote locations very high risk you hear the explosions around you you're then often very far away from that safety yes it is but then i think of you know that to put yourself at that risk is because you're doing something which is really purposeful you you don't do that if it's not necessary if it's not critical if it's not purposeful and i think when we the people who have remained in these areas when we meet with them and they see the support and you hear from them that the appreciation and the that they are not forgotten and that you make the effort to go there that's when you feel that it is worth it i wonder if i mean it must be very worrying for your family i believe you have children too do they worry about you and how do you reassure them that you're going to be all right they were very they were worried in the beginning you know we moved to ukraine together as a family from lebanon and they were here with me the first um six, seven months um before they had to to leave uh, ukraine um, evacuate in in mid february and of course those first weeks and months of the of the war when it was constantly on the news and the pictures and the images were very dramatic and there were days when i i i didn't have we didn't have time to talk because we literally worked around the clock and the situation was so volatile then i think they were they were they were worried when i was still in kiev and um now i think they they don't follow the news so closely on ukraine which i'm happy with because uh, they don't they don't need to to see um everything but what do they think about having a mom who works for unhcr where i mean i guess they they were with you and they understand what the work is for them i i think they have because they have lived with me we've lived together in five different countries and they've seen which ones were those i mean th- so they were babies where so well they were born in geneva when i was working at our headquarters then we were in zambia then we had um a few years in stockholm where we have a regional office covering the nordic and baltic countries then in lebanon and then in ukraine so they have moved around and seen what the work means but they were you know they they loved ukraine they were very happy in kiev and it was a great you know place for us to be as a family with teenagers especially after quite challenging years in in Lebanon with covid online schooling for a year and a half the explosion that, and so on and then they were very happy had made new friends here started new school and then they had to leave and and do online schooling from sweden from their with their classmates you know from the school in ukraine spread out across the world so i think they understand what the work means but of course it's a they are it's a it's a huge contribution for them to live separated from from their mom and yeah this this wasn't our plan but when something like this war happens to to people and our humanitarian mission is so it it appears in front of you 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 stay with the people who then need you to be there and with your colleagues who are so 
shocked and devastated and impacted. So I think as a family, we never, we never discussed whether I should stay or leave, try to leave Ukraine and, and together with them. That was not a discussion, but um, of course, it's, it's, a, it's a huge, um, it's a huge sacrifice or a huge pain also to be away from your family. I'm sure, I'm sure it is. And at least you can go visit them, right? Yes, exactly. I can, I can do that. And, and, um, you know, we are in, we, we can call each other, we can visit each other. And uh, I think they, they, I hope they understand that it's for, um, it's, it's for a, purposeful reason. It's because the mission that I'm here to serve together with an amazing team of colleagues is beyond just a job. Otherwise, I wouldn't do this. I wouldn't live separated from them if it wasn't because I so much believed in our protection mission as that enabler What is keeping you awake at night these days? Well, in Ukraine, it is um, air raid alarms still keep us very much awake. In many of the places I go to, Dnipro, Kharkiv, it's almost every night. And, you know, when, when you are woken up by those, you know, the thought is always, you know, I... I hope we will survive this night, you know, and and feeling that when I say we survive, I really mean all of us, the people living in Ukraine. Because the attacks often happen during night and not all people, you know, there are people who die during these attacks. So that's what keeps me awake. Is there anything that gives you hope? Yes, there is, really. And that seeing this incredible um, solidarity that, you know, we talked about the volunteers in Ukraine, ordinary people who are opening their homes and opening their kitchens and, and you know, their hearts to people and, and around the world. That gives me hope that there is the care and compassion, but also seeing how incredibly strong and determined people are to get up and recover and look forward and not to, to give up. That, that, that gives me a lot of hope. That's what also gives you know, us the energy, I think, to continue working and, and in this ultra marathon of a response that um, the people we meet, and for me very much the colleagues I work with, their incredible you know, professionalism and hard work and dedication gives me a lot of hope and energy to, to continue working. Well, there is so much humanity out there, even though it might is so ugly in the in the field of war and in the awful dark fog of war. Carolina, thank you so much for joining me from Kiev and I wish you all the best and please take care. Thank you. Thank you very much, Melissa. Thank you for listening to Awake at Night. We'll be back soon with more incredible and inspiring stories from people working against huge challenges to make this world a better and safer place. To find out more about the series and the extraordinary people featured, do visit un.org slash awake hyphen at hyphen night. Do subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and please take the time to review us. It helps more people find the show. Thanks to my editor, Bethany Bell, to Adam Paler and to my colleagues at the UN, Katerina Kitidi, Roberta Politi, Geneva Damianti, Tulan Batiki, and Becerra Costova, 
and the team at the UN Studio. The original music for this podcast was written and performed by Nadine Shaw and produced by Ben Hillier. Additional music was by Pascal Wise.